I grew up in the ancient capital city of Xi'an in Shanxi province of northwestern China. It's one of the oldest cities in the world, over 4,000 years, spanning six dynasties from the western Zhou to the Tang. Back then it was known as Chang'an. Some of you may have heard of this place because it's home to the UNESCO World Heritage Site, Mausoleum of the First Qin Emperor, also known as the Terracotta Army. The first Qin Emperor, aka Qin Shi Huang, died in 210 BCE, but the mausoleum, located at the foot of the Lishan Mountain, was discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers digging for a well. It led to the discovery of thousands of terracotta figures, horses, chariots, weapons, and many more highly sophisticated and well-preserved artworks, as well as architectural structures and artifacts. Qin Shi Huang was obviously responsible for the deaths of millions of people, not just those who died while building the mausoleum, but throughout his military social and political campaigns. So it's not like most Chinese people celebrate this guy, although I'm sure there are still lots who do, but this place is an incredible time capsule of our cultural history and ingenious examples of human artistic and technological creation. Thus, the UNESCO World Heritage Committee inscribed this complex in 1987 as a designated World Heritage Site on the basis of exceptional technical and artistic qualities unique testimony to the military history and high documentary value, being the largest preserved site in China with unique architectural and urban planning ensembles, and association with an event of universal significance, the first unification of historic Chinese territories. Since then, this site has received provincial and federal protection, which prevents development or economic activities around the area that can jeopardize its integrity. Most recently in 2010, due to pressures of urban development and tourism, the provincial government passed a new conservation plan, clarifying the construction and development prohibition boundaries. I live in Canada now, and we have some UNESCO World Heritage sites here as well. The historic district of Old Quebec is the only North American city with preserved ramparts, complete with bastions, gates, and defensive works. Coming from a country with lots of urban and military walled fortifications, these architectural ensembles are of great interest to me. I haven't actually visited Old Quebec yet, I'm afraid they'll be kind of upset about how bad my French is, but I do want to visit one day. Unless you think UNESCO only designates human constructed sites as world heritage, it actually inscribes and thus help enforce protection of natural heritage sites as well. The Pimichiowan Aki is a series of rivers, lakes, wetlands, and boreal forests in the heart of the Anishinaabeg people's ancestral homes and has been their fishing, hunting, and gathering grounds for over 7,000 years. It was inscribed by UNESCO in 2018 for outstanding achievements in land preservation, which is also a core principle of Anishinaabe cultural traditions and beliefs. So what is UNESCO World Heritage? Why does it exist? And what exactly does it do? UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. It was founded in 1945, aimed at fostering peace, humanitarianism, and intellectual understanding. However, the idea for such an organization actually dates back to the League of Nations, which was founded in the aftermath of World War I. In 1959, during the construction of the Aswan High Dam in Egypt, it became evident that the valley containing the Abu Simbel temples and ancient Egyptian treasure would be flooded, and there was seemingly no way of stopping it from happening. Governments in Egypt and Sudan appealed to UNESCO for help. UNESCO then launched an international safeguarding campaign that included archaeological research, careful dismantling of existing temples, the moving of and reassembly of temples to higher dry ground. More than 50 countries participated in this campaign, physically or through financial contributions. The idea for combining conservation efforts in both cultural and natural sites came out of a USA White House conference in 1965, where the World Heritage Trust was proposed and later established. This, along with various other conservation proposals, were presented at the 1972 United Nations Conference and led to the adoption of the Convention Concerning the Protection of World Culture and Natural Heritage, which is defined as having cultural or natural significance that is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for 
present and future generations of all humanity. The World Heritage Committee meets once a year to review new submissions to the list. The committee consists of 21 state parties elected by the General Assembly. In addition to approving nominations and inscribing sites, the committee also reviews reports of existing properties, decides which, if any, to include on the in danger list, and vote to delist properties who don't meet conservation goals. So the multi-million dollar question is, because it really is, there's a lot of potential money in the World Heritage Fund at stake here, is the World Heritage Program successful? Does it meet its goals to do what it wants to do? In a way, yes, of course it's had many tremendous and almost unbelievable successes, like the incredibly complex projects I mentioned at the top of the video. Not just in successful restoration and ongoing tangible commitments around the world for continued preservation, but also in fostering international collaboration, understanding, and diplomacy. And of course, we're preserving our collective history and legacy, which I know is not something everyone is into, but some of the most prolific comments I get from my my modern architecture videos are from people saying how sad they are for the loss of traditional architecture in their hometowns, as well as around the world due to modern developments. So clearly this is not just something that's important to historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, and some architects, and that's really valuable. But here's the hard truth. The World Heritage Convention is in crisis. At its 36th session in St. Petersburg in 2012, Irina Bokova, UNESCO Director General at the time, said the World Heritage Convention faces a fundamental challenge, that of its credibility and its future. In recent years, some developments within the inscription process have weakened the principles of scientific excellence and impartiality that are at the heart of the convention. Every year, the nomination and review process becomes more time-consuming, controversial, and politically polarizing. Many heritage entries are riddled with disputed historical territories, national and religious tensions, and individual biases over cultural values and achievements. I mean, you don't even need to have nations from across the world to have heated debates over an architectural style's historic merits. Just between a few other history YouTubers and me, we have vehement disagreements about why brutalism is either horribly oppressive and should be wiped off the face of the earth, or totally fascinating, unique, and worth of historic preservation. When Francis Norpa de Calais Mining Basin was inscribed in 2012, some didn't think such an industrial structure deserved to be on the same list as world-class monuments like Giza pyramids and Taj Mahal. But this is the exact type of listing that challenges the elitist out of touch with modern realities notion that many academics and average citizens alike accuse UNESCO of holding. In addition to her previous statements, Irina Bokova also said, I believe we stand at the crossroads with a clear choice before us. We can continue to gather year after year as accountants of the World Heritage label, adding more sites to the list, adhering less and less strictly to its criteria. Criteria. Or we can choose another path. We can decide to act and think as visionaries, to rejuvenate the World Heritage Convention and confront the challenges of the 21st century. World Heritage is not a beauty contest. Many argue that the list is constantly dominated by properties from Europe, which is true for historic reasons, but even in recent years, about half of newly inscribed sites are still in Europe and North America. However, UNESCO has been actively pushing and encouraging diverse representation for decades. More recently, in 2009, an upstreaming process was introduced, which assists underrepresented states in preparing better and more solid proposals to the committee. In addition, only developing nations have direct access to the World Heritage Fund. Developed nations like the UK often contribute tens of millions of dollars to the fund, while some developing nations pay as little as less than $100. While the World Heritage Committee does cycle every couple of years, and each state member only typically serves a four-year term, upon further examination, it appears a group of 15 to 20 countries constantly rotate on and off the committee. In addition, some of the state parties that are often on the committee tend to get into packs with each other and like to vote as a unified bloc against other states. In 2010, the committee did request an external audit of its initiatives and strategies. One part of the report that really alarmed me was that many sites had poor protection and management programs that cannot handle the growing effects of climate
climate change and anthropogenic pressures. UNESCO's funding for, at the time, less than a thousand properties was already grossly insufficient. In the audit, Canada and Estonia, two of the neutral countries, accused the committee of premature inscriptions and the rush to inscribe rather than conserve sites. Sorry, I know us Canadians like to annoy bigger nations sometimes, didn't realize Estonians were also like this too. Of course, while some complain that other states are not properly following guidelines, other states are frustrated by the overly complex regulations World Heritage tries to impose on everyone. But not everybody just comes to these convention sessions to complain. Some do offer solutions. A senior African delegate suggested looking to one of the more successful advisory bodies, the IUCN, as an example to emulate. Why is the IUCN successful? Its leaders directly engage with local workshops around the world. It's better resourced because it includes thousands of members from government and non-governmental agencies and has over 11,000 voluntary scientists. It appeals to a mass array of public and private support, both in actual participation and through financial contributions, rather than relying on formal public funding. The director of the World Heritage Center in 2010, Kishore Rao, also suggested to many states, such as China, that instead of spending millions of US dollars every year preparing impeccable documents so that they can get more sites on the World Heritage List, maybe the time, effort, and money would be better spent in a system of cooperation and mentoring in place of that. On the topic of money, it's a pretty big problem. In 2011, the Obama administration froze the United States contribution to UNESCO, 60 million annually, 22% of the total UNESCO budget due to political differences with other states. I don't really wanna talk about the reason because I hate politics. I'll just leave some links in the description so you can make up your own mind about if the US was right to withdraw. In 2017, the US formally announced its withdrawal from UNESCO and officially exited as of January 1st, 2019. By then, its outstanding balance to UNESCO had accumulated to 600 million. The US will, however, stay on UNESCO as an observer state on non-politicized issues. But let's be clear, this decision has bipartisan support. It was initiated by the Obama administration and carried out by the Trump administration. Remember, this whole UNESCO World Heritage thing was the US's idea in the first place. Lynn Mesco, professor of anthropology and archeology span at the University of Pennsylvania, also argued that a lot of US citizens have a misconception that a UNESCO inscribed site is not US sovereign territory and that the United Nations somehow control these sites. That's incorrect. UNESCO technically has no power over any nation. They offer strong recommendations and hope all states continue to to follow its guidelines, which many states often don't. And the only potential repercussion is getting delisted as a heritage site, which almost never happens because the committee rarely wants to anger state members. However, many states still do take the World Heritage Program seriously because having a UNESCO inscribed site can be prestigious and it can often draw in lots of tourism that stimulate their economy, resulting in more money to actually conserve these sites. So yes, while many states like to accuse the UN and World Heritage community of being overbearing, UNESCO is quite powerless in stopping cultural destruction of monuments, especially due to violence and armed conflict. During its session in 2012, the 40th anniversary of the convention, the committee called for an end to the violence and destruction occurring in Mali, including the city of Timbuktu and Tomb of Askia. The Indian ambassador, though, didn't think UNESCO had the capacity to have any effect on the situation. We cannot do this. We're getting into dangerous terrain. All we have are computers, papers, and pens. You're dealing with bandits and criminals, and we only have papers and pens. The international community at this time has not set up specific actions and effective measures, which those who take human life and destroy cultural heritage have. But to me, this just further cements why we need UNESCO. We don't convince people to achieve peace with words alone. We do it through having to collaborate on projects together, by finding common ground and mutual interests together, and commit to each other through tangible, ratified documents documents and economic incentives. I grew up in two vastly different cities on opposite sides of the world. Both places are very ethnically and culturally diverse in their own unique ways. I've also traveled to many places around Europe and volunteered in South America. Whatever continent I'm on, I've seen racial tensions, centuries-long resentment and violence play out among people I know and don't know. But I've also seen strangers from across the world who have nothing to do with each other help each other out. I know people who have been in wars where their lives were saved by 
by soldiers from the opposite side. So honestly, despite all the conflict and terrible things that happen in the world, I don't think I'll ever see human collaboration as impossible. We've been doing it for thousands of years, at least. I refuse to believe that with all this technology available to us now, this is the moment when we can't get our shit together. But after hearing all of this, some of you will inevitably want to toss all of UNESCO out a planet-sized window and just start over, which is one option. But when I made a video about how to solve the problems of modern architecture, many of you liked my conclusion that it's better to adopt thoughtful evolution than radical revolution. And if you're a fan of preserving historic monuments or subscribe to humanist values that stem out of the European Renaissance, you may also agree that we shouldn't just demolish everything and start over. The UNESCO World Heritage Convention will turn 50 next year, but it remains the only major international instrument for safeguarding the world's heritage. Those who criticize it are not necessarily trying to undermine it. Most desperately want to set it back on the path it intends. Conservation also doesn't have to result in the stifling of development and technological progress. UNESCO's first project, Saving the Abu Simbel Temple, was a testament to that. Using scientific research and technology to carefully move and reassemble these monuments while allowing the new dam to be built. I haven't visited my childhood home in many years and honestly don't even know how much of what I remember is still standing. I now build hospitals in Canada, but I still want my cultural heritage to be preserved. And I don't just mean my Chinese and Canadian heritage. I mean all of it, everywhere in the world. The name of my hometown, Xi'an, translates to Western peace, but I've always liked its original name, Chang'an, much better. It means eternal peace. But did you know that there's a UNESCO World Heritage Site that's partially submerged underwater? The imaginatively named Group of Monuments at Mahabalipuram is an inscribed site located off the coast of the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, famous for its cave temples, shore temple, and 8th century AD art and architecture. However, there also used to be a myth that there were also seven large pagodas that have since sunk into the sea or been destroyed. This myth, however, was revealed to be true after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004 washed away centuries of silt from the sites, revealing several small statues and temples on the shore. A subsequent archaeological survey was then launched, which discovered many larger temples and walls, likely also dating back to the 8th century. If you're interested in other mythical lost cities from around the world, come on over to my channel, Canubis, where I just made a video in tandem with this one about three legendary sunken cities from around the world. But not generic mythical cities like Atlantis or El Dorado, actually some more obscure ones so that, you know, you'd actually learn something. Thank you guys so much for watching. This topic was actually suggested by one of the members of the Articulations Discord server, where we also discuss videos as well as a lot of other fun stuff. So if you're interested in participating and suggesting future video topics, maybe you'd like to join us. In addition, these videos are very time consuming for me to make. So if you have a little bit, even me like $3 or a little bit more, Again, like no obligation. I have a tip jar at coffee.com. I'm gonna leave a link in the description below. Every little bit helps. Thanks so much, guys. I'll talk to you next time. Some do offer solutions. A senior African delegate. Oh!